People of the universe, there's only one fantastic Negrito in the world, and I'm hanging out with Rob on Front Row Live. What are your thoughts on this brand new festival? This is just the second year. I thought it was amazing. Uh, some very good acts, um, good food, uh, great production, and the crowd was amazing. For at least for me, they were spilling out into the uh, into the uh, over. Yeah, it was amazing. So I had a an amazing crowd. Nice. And, and I think it's it's also awesome that you're coming into this to this festival with a brand new record, "Please Don't Be Dead," which is such a intense title. Um, talk to me a little bit about the title. What kind of influenced that th that title for a record? Well, I thought of it when I was on tour in Europe quite a bit, and I think that people in Europe were really troubled about the direction that the United States was uh, taking. I think people are used to us being somewhat stable, and we were always at least saying that, hey, we welcome immigrants, we love diversity, and I just think within the last year, the United States has been saying a lot of really disturbing things, especially, uh, look what just happened there at the border where they were separating uh, children. children from their parents, and that's, that's not who we are. And so when I was writing the album, I would really wanted to say like America, the idea of you is beautiful. All these people came from all over the world, and I'm a son of an immigrant, and I know that immigrants contribute so much to this country and it would be nothing really without immigrants let's be real and uh so i was hoping that I, I that idea of america please don't be dead like love unity peace hope that shining light on the hill like we're different you know we welcome you if you want to come and work and be a part of this thing did you did you ever imagine you'd be writing somewhat of a political record ever in your career well i don't think i write political records in in my view i don't if I was a uh, political, I think I'd be full of shit, because usually politicians are pretty full of shit. And there's an angle, and they want this. I, I'm a dude that was playing on the street four years ago. I, I just want to write songs about what's happening. I don't, I don't know if that's political in my in my view. I don't think that it's political. I think it's just, hey, I'm a citizen of the world, and of this country. I live here, and this is what's going on. So if there was hot chicks walking around with short skirts on, I'll write about that. If there was dogs, you know, slapping each other. I don't know. I'm being silly, but you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I totally I get like that. the idea of being political at all. I've noticed, you know, especially this year, because of all of that that's going on, um, you know, I've talked to a few artists that are scared to dabble into politics or they're scared to talk about Happening. what's happening today because they might lose someone or that you know so it's you know that that never crosses your mind I mean let's be real man I mean being an artist is about losing people you know people we have to challenge people we have to challenge ourselves I became an artist because I really believe that music art film writing all these amazing um, gifts of creativity can really point the world in more of a direction of like Love and brother, I like that shit. Maybe I'm a hippie, I don't know. But I like that too. I think it's better when we're all different people getting along. And even my name, Fantastic Negrito, I was like, it was so natural for me to say Negrito because I'd grown up with uh, Latinos and Mexicans, El Salvadorians, and I'd always hear that in the banda songs. I think they're called banda. Like, Negrito, Negrito, and I thought, so it's just, like that's part of my culture too, although I'm, you know, African American, but I love absorbing that um, Latino culture, the Asians, Koreans. It, it's beautiful, man. That's what this is about. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, with, with this record, um, again, you self-produced it. Yeah. And it's something that, I mean, you seem to continue to do in your career. Is, is it, do you prefer to self-produce just because it's easier for you to, to get what you want done? Or, you know, are you just... I don't, there you go. I, I couldn't find the word, but there you go. You got it. <laughs> I'm an egomania. Well, I think, uh, I think I like doing different things, and I think that I would love for someone uh, to produce me. I just haven't came across the right circumstances because I don't think anyone would have made records the way that I'm making them. You know, the, when I go to produce a record, it's just I think completely different than... Um, the way some conventional thinkers think, like I don't, I don't like fear. 
I like challenge and I like, um, I don't want to make a hit song, you know what I mean? I don't, I'm not worried about the gatekeeper being accepted. I have no interest in being a pop star or any of that shit. So I just want to really enjoy this, man, because it's so amazing to have an opportunity to, to just breathe and live and um, contribute something to the world that we live in, which is tumultuous, beautiful, and terrible. All at the same time. <laughs> at the same time, yeah. Now, going into the studio to, to create this record, how do, you, how do you feel you challenge yourself this time around uh, as opposed to prior, prior songs or prior records that you've worked on? Well, the first thing I did is anyone that talked to me about the Grammy, I just kicked them out. What is that? I don't know what that is. I kicked them out of my life. <laughs> and then I fired the producer from the last record, which was me. Yeah. I sat down, I talked to me, I'm like, look, you're fired, you motherfucker. Yes, you're fired and don't come here anymore. And we're going to, you know, make a song to connect with people. I wanted to produce a record like, I call it the universal riff. Like that blues riff that, it just gets everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. Like, even neo-Nazis like Johnny Be Good, that guitar riff. I mean, I, you, can't, you can't go wrong with that. So I wanted to really uh, write and produce the record really around riffs, and bass and grooves and chants and... This is like all this, where this black roots music came from, where people were just in the fields. They didn't want to be there, but they had to be there. And that was really the origin of all this American music. And so I try to tap into that as much as I can in my way of doing it. Right. Yeah. And as, you, as you're creating that, you know, what, what is that process like for you? Do you, do you sit down and, and record the same day that you write? Do you sit down and write and then figure out later on how you want to record it? Do melodies come up before lyrics? Like, how does it work for you? Well, for me, it's all just very organic and it just happens. It could be, you know, beating on the chair. It could be, that sounds weird, beating on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> it could, <laughs> Anything is possible here. What kind of interview is this, man? <laughs> I don't know. Where are you taking me? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> No, could just that heat is getting to you. Heat, man. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's just organic. Sometimes melodies, drum beats, guitars. Yeah, it's organic. I like it like that, where it's just happening. And maybe I had one thing in mind, and then oh shit, this is happening, and that's great. Right. I kind of like that. Now, with the with the instruments that you use on on your records, what is the most unique instrument that you feel that has been used on a song, and people might not even know about? Uh, I don't know, I always make my own stomps. Like, you know, I, the two by fours and duds, and I always infuse those with kick drums. I always want my records to sound like you can, like you're sitting around on the porch. It's very kind of cool. Even it's big, like plastic hamburgers, like down, 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 I just always want it to be right there. And I don't, Try, I always try and put least amount of things that I can put into record. It's like I want to travel the shortest distance to get to that, that thing that makes us all. Right. So I, to answer the question, I think like, you know, rocks, you no know, blocks and woods. I like stacking all that stuff up. Now, as, as you mentioned, like you like to get there faster. You know, how long did did it take you to create music before you can figure out those kind of ways of just like, this is what I want, that's how I'm going to make it? Years. <laughs> took a, it came from a lot of failure. Yeah, of course. But that, yeah, it took a, a very long time and, you know, listening to things and really trying to get the essence, not sound like someone else, but the essence. And that's how I fell in love with uh, all the Delta Blues players because there's nothing more punk rock than a guy in the 20s sitting down with his guitar against the whole world, against segregation, against oppression and racism and being called a boy and not a man. He sat down and took the world on. And I want that sense of urgency in my records. Now, with the tracks that are on this, on this album, do you feel like there's a specific track that was a little difficult to create? Um, well. I toured, a boy named Andrew was really different. And I was glad that it was different because I wanted to make a record where you make a left, you make a right, and, and challenge the listener. I like challenging. The hardest one may have been a song called Dark 
windows and I I, uh, I wrote that as a tribute to my friend Chris Cornell and uh, you know it was tough because I've done three tours with him you know he's someone that I respected and loved. Someone close to you. Yeah someone that I respected and loved and you know, we lost him that was tough. A lot of tears trying to sing that one. Yeah yeah. How do you how are you able to get vulnerable in the studio for a song like that like that that's that's heavy. Well I'm able to really get vulnerable because I have a team of people that challenge me. Like I'm in a collective and people and get to comment and so they, they push me. Now when you've toured with artists just like Chris, um, who, you know, are huge in the music industry and, you know, there's no, you know, whatever tour, whatever show they do is going to be massive. So when you tour with someone like that, like what do you, what do you learn from those, from those tours? Chris, for example, what did you pick up from his tours? Well, the first tour was acoustic guitar around Europe and the first thing is I learned how to play to 2,000 people sitting down. I, I was like, wow, they're sitting down. That sounds rough. <laughs> and so I remember and I flew from Australia to Norway, met Chris, played the first show and then I sat and I watched him. Just like how to be really comfortable and really how to connect with that audience. Now he had his way and I had to, through watching him, I was able to do it my way and tell my story. And then when I did Temple of the Dog with him, uh, that was just sensational, man, amazing, because here you had all these, you know, millionaire musicians, Temple of the Dog, you know, the Pearl Jam guys, and Chef Ahmed and Matt and all the, and they're practicing backstage. And I was like, wow. This really happens. <laughs> they come two hours for the show and That's so cool. they're just all practicing. And it was a big lesson. Like, take your craft very serious. Now, as, you, as you moved forward to doing your own tours and your own shows, did you incorporate a lot, of, a lot of the things that you did on those tours on your sets? Well, sure. You learn and then whatever you're able to absorb, of course. Yeah. I tell the band, warm up, practice, you know, <laughs> be on time and take it respect your audience now for your style of music which i i don't even know where to even center it as far as like a genre because i feel like anybody can listen to it which is why i feel festivals are just perfect for you but what are, you know how different are your festival shows as opposed to your tour shows well first my career has been one of the gatekeeper telling me that i couldn't do it all the time so, because I didn't really believe in genres, I really don't like genres. I like artists. And I feel like when you're an artist, what are the barriers? And I call what I do black roots music for everyone. <laughs> because it's like, I think I take rock, funk, soul, punk, blues, and I just I cook it in a pot beautifully and uh, serve it up. So I like that because that really gives respect to you know the originators and I think everybody in America we're doing that we just probably don't say it but we're we're doing that it's a beautiful thing you know we this music was left for us and, yeah. now today again you perform here at Arroyo Seco what else are, are you up to for the remainder of the summer and the remainder of the year now that the record's out well I'm supporting the record I just did six weeks in Europe so now I'll start doing six weeks here and then I'll do six weeks in Europe again. Then I'll do six weeks here. And then I'll end up in Australia around New Year's. It's very busy. All lined up, ready to go. All lined up. <laughs> now for those that haven't heard you yet, what makes you so different from other artists today? Well, I think uh, what makes Fantastic Negrito different is, is uh, the fearlessness, I believe, personally, in that um, you know, I, I have a desire to connect with people because for me the people are my record company four years ago I was busking on the street and um, I really make music to just connect with those people they matter to me the charts don't matter to me the awards don't matter to me what matters to me is have that same spirit of just playing the people getting home from work and for making sure that music is medicinal in these hard times and as an artist I want to contribute and not take and that's my place.